For around 4 billion years, the night sky has been an unlimited resource. However, for over 100 years, light pollution has been filling the night sky. As a somewhat unintended consequence of modern civilization, and this seemingly infinite resource of beauty has been clouded with pollution. Since the 1980s, night sky activism has been growing and fighting to return the mystic value of a starlit sky to what it once was. This week on the Greener Business Podcast, we speak with Anthony Arrigo about his company, Starry Night Light, which sets out to help customers buy lighting products that do not ruin the resource of the night sky. Originally, Arrigo had not intended to start a business that incorporated his love for the night sky, but instead began by researching products for his personal use for his home in Park City, Utah. About four years ago, my wife and I uh, decided we were going to build a house here in Park City. And I'd been a, a, a night sky activist for a number of years. So my wife basically said, you are in charge of uh, coming up with a, a uh, list of what, acceptable light fixtures. Uh, sky-friendly light fixtures for the house. And so I went out and scoured the web and went to a bunch of lighting showrooms and spent hours going through uh, all the available catalogs and whatnot and came up with a list for her and I to sit down and uh, basically decide what we were going to put on our house. And it was from that list, essentially, that I essentially started Starry Night Lights. And uh, so we've been for the last uh, three plus years um, offering that list and a greatly extended uh, selection uh, to our customers. So what is light pollution and why is it a problem? Well, um, light pollution, just in a general term, light pollution is misdirected light, if you will. Uh, It's light that shines, from my perspective and and, and my top priority, light pollution is light that shines up into the night sky. Light pollution is also light that shines across property lines. So it might not necessarily even go up in the light in the night sky, but it shines into your neighbor's windows, and it shines into areas where wildlife exists, and it just shines basically into places where it doesn't belong. I mean, it, even if it's on your property, if, if, if your outdoor lights that are supposed to light your walkway and your driveway and perhaps your deck are shining into, uh, into vegetation and stuff, it's, that, that's kind of even by a stretch. That is light pollution. Um, and it, it obstructs astronomers' views of the night sky. It wastes incredible amounts of energy. 30% of outdoor lighting is estimated to go up into the night sky. Um, So you put lights out so that people come to your house, can safely approach your house and walk up and knock on your front door. And 30% of of the energy consumed and the light produced is going up into the night sky. It's a complete waste. Um, and, and so, like I said, it's, it's a problem on, uh, on a number of, of uh, different levels. So what is it that makes your lighting fixtures night sky friendly? Sky friendly lighting, uh, it's a pretty simple concept. Sky friendly lighting is basically light fixtures that shine light on the ground. And, and that sounds simple enough and you think, well, my goodness, what lights wouldn't shine light on the ground? Well, you know, pretty much any light fix you buy is going to shine light on the ground. The problem is that, you know, most of the lights, if you were to go to your local hardware store or lighting store, most of the lights that, are, that you would find offered for sale do not meet that characteristic. They will shine light up into the night sky. They will shine light into your neighbor's windows. And they'll put a small portion of the light they produce on the ground. So your 100-watt bulb is maybe putting, you know, 25 or 30 watts on the ground and 50 watts into the night sky and, you know, 20 or 30 watts into your neighbor's windows without having to develop some incredible new fancy technology. If you can just turn your outdoor lights off and, and, and save, you know, nationally billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of tons of coal, hundreds of millions of t- gallons and barrels of petroleum, we can reduce 
the amount of greenhouse gases we're putting in the sky. Simply, no billion dollar investment in, in the technologies. Flip the switch, turn the light off, or put a motion sensor on it. If you put a motion sensor on your outdoor lights, they will be off 99% of the time. You know why? Because there's nobody out in front of your house. 99% of the time, occasionally, once every several days or several weeks, Somebody walks up your driveway, knocks on your door, and you let them in. Exposure to artificial lighting has been known to impact the health of wildlife and even humans. Um, they would noticed, um, anecdotally if you will, that night shift workers had 60 or 70 percent more, more likelihood or higher likelihood of developing breast cancer than day shift workers. And another anecdotal piece of evidence was that uh, blind women were 50% less likely to v develop breast cancer than, than women uh, with sight. And, and they determined, or just really quickly, they said, you know, it's kind of odd. It's probably, it's very likely linked to sight. And sure enough, they did some studies and found that light at night suppresses the body's production of melatonin. Melatonin is the body's chief cancer-fighting agent. So if, if you produce lots of melatonin, which you, you normally do when you sleep in, in a dark environment at, you know, at night, you produce lots of melatonin, and, and this is your body's top way of fighting, uh, of fighting various forms of cancer. Well, when you're in a bright environment because lights are shining into, uh, uh, into your sleeping area, your body produces less men melatonin and in some instances doesn't produce any melatonin. And this basically leaves the gates wide open and uh, cancers develop. And this is just kind of a worldwide phenomena. And we're just kind of getting our arms around this. It's almost like back in the 70s when the whole concept of secondhand smoke came out. Well, everybody knew uh, if you smoked, okay, it was kind of accepted. You were at a higher incidence of lung cancer and, and various other ailments. And it was only, only in recent years that, that it became, you know, accepted that, okay, you know, you're smoking next to me, my, rate of, my risk of cancer is elevated. And, 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 and I think we're kind of at that point with, with light pollution, that, um, you know, you've got your light on and it's shining in my bedroom window at night. You know, you may think I should, you know, I should just deal with it and get on with my life, but my risk of cancer is now elevated. It'll be, I'm, I'm expecting that in the next few years uh, it will become common knowledge um, that this is a bad practice to just shine lights indiscriminately, you know, all night long. In the February 2001 edition of Sky and Telescope magazine, John Bortle developed a light pollution scale to help amateur astronomers describe conditions in different locations. Class 9 areas have the highest level of light pollution, being mainly inner city locations, where in the midst of night you can read newsprint outside and only a select few of the brightest celestial objects can be seen through the orange tinted glow of the night sky. Under a class 1 sky, the Milky Way is brilliantly defined and produces scatter shadows across the ground. The zodiacal light from sunlight reflecting cosmic dust spans across the sky with a clear yellowish glow which adds a soft contrast to the blue and white emitting light of the Milky Way. However, 99% of people in Europe and the United States have never seen a truly dark sky from where they live due to human activity. This is a 16-inch Cassegrain Schmidt telescope, which uh, is designed for uh, observing stellar objects and, and other deep sky objects. The light comes in, uh, of course, from the very top of the telescope and reflects off of a primary mirror, which is situated in the bottom, a 16-inch diameter mirror, in the center of which there is a hole. Now what happens is the light reflects off that mirror, is brought to a secondary mirror, which is at the top of the telescope, and that secondary mirror reflects the light back down to the focal point of the telescope, which is located uh, at this instrument, which is hanging from the bottom. Each semester I would teach uh, an introductory astronomy course that had perhaps 150 to 200 students, 
And one thing that I always did near the beginning of each course was to survey the students and ask them how many of them had ever seen the Milky Way at night in the night sky. And on average, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of those students, that is 10 or 20 out of 100, would raise their hands indicating that they had in fact seen the Milky Way. That means that 8 out of 10 had never seen the Milky Way. And the reason for that, of course, is that most of these students lived in the St. Louis area, population of about two and a half million people, a lot of light pollution, and therefore at night, when they would go out to look at the sky, the sky was too bright to see the Milky Way. All they could see were the brighter stars and, and planets. And this is typical of many people in our urban areas today. Most people have never really seen the Milky Way, which is quite different from the history of the world, because if you go back to earlier cultures around the world, the Milky Way was a common was common knowledge. Uh, people appreciated what the night sky looked like. In our modern age, in our urban areas, we have become detached from the night sky. We no longer are really aware of what's there on a first-person basis. And I think it's very important that people be aware of their environment and things that are up there. So this is one reason, I think, for limiting the night sky uh, light pollution. Starry Night Lights can be found at starrynightlights.com. That's with two R's. For more information on this podcast and to see all previous episodes, visit us online at greenerbusinessshow.org.